So let's just end with a discussion of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is a fascinating article showing that excessive gluconeogenesis causes hepatic insulin resistance paradox and its sequela. The sequela, which is a fancy word for the downstream effects, are non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Well, what causes excessive gluconeogenesis? Uh, insulin resistance causes excess GNG. So it's not fructose causing uh, fatty liver disease, it's elevated cortisol, insulin resistance, and then you get fatty liver disease. Let's go further down that rabbit hole. So here's a study in rats suggesting that it's dietary fat stimulating the development of NAFLD more potently than dietary fructose in Sprague Dolly rats. Any guesses as to the type of dietary fat they're using? Well, it's a mixture of saturated and polyunsaturated, but it's mostly garbage polyunsaturated seed oils in rats. And we know that when you give rats or mice fructose, they do much higher levels of de novo lipogenesis, which is the conversion of fructose into fat in the liver. Humans do that to a very, very low extent. There's really no evidence that fructose raises triglycerides in humans. So here's a study. High sucrose intake ameliorates, that is, improves the accumulation of hepatic triacylglycerol, which is liver fat, promoted by restraint stress in young rats. So basically they tie a bunch of young rats up. We know that if you stress rats out, you get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the rats. Consistent with humans, it's cortisol that is causing excess gluconeogenesis leading to NAFLD, but you give them sugar and the fatty liver gets better. So tell me again how sugar promotes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And again, yes, it's a study in rats, but do we really believe the physiology is that different? Um, cortisol and fatty liver researchers find the cause of severe metabolic disorders. Yes, it is cortisol, not fructose, that causes fatty liver disease. And guess what? A ketogenic low-carb diet raises cortisol. So the question should really be, how many of the people in the ketogenic community who are all very intelligent and well-intentioned have some degree of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease I propose that we all do liver ultrasounds and we settle the issue just so that everyone can understand and be as healthy as possible. Here's a study, fructose, high fructose corn syrup, sucrose, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And what we find is that the available evidence is not sufficiently robust to draw conclusions regarding the effects of fructose, high fructose corn syrup, or sucrose consumption on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, meaning that it doesn't really look like fructose is that bad. Excess dietary fructose does not alter the gut microbiota or permeability in humans. Just in case you were wondering, people have often correlated intestinal permeability and gut microbiota changes with NAFLD. That's a randomized controlled pilot study in humans. Um, dietary fructose did not cause those problems. Higher fructose intake inversely associated with the risk of NAFLD in older Finnish adults, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Again, that's epidemiology, but the association is not there. And this is the effects of dietary fructose, sucrose, and lactose in the induction of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the rat. The takeaway is that they didn't cause it. <laughs> they didn't cause it. So where is the evidence that fructose causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? I don't know. But I think it's uh, pretty easily settled by, I like this idea of, um, serial ultrasounds. Like, let's just get liver ultrasounds of a bunch of people in the health space. I'd like to see some keto folks get liver ultrasounds. I'd like to see some folks that believe um, that they are in doing well in the longevity space get liver ultrasounds. I'd like to see people who believe that ApoB causes atherosclerosis get liver ultrasounds. And we'll just compare the amount of liver fat for all of us, and that'll be a good metric, at least some indication of what's going on here. So, um, and I mean this as respectfully as possible. I just, I think that a lot of health influencers, nutritionists, physicians can argue round and round about studies, but let's just actually try and put some legit clinical outcomes on the table so that people can see how healthy any type of dietary strategy is. That's why I show my blood work in podcasts like this, because I want to show as much beyond a shadow of a doubt that what I'm doing creates health, or you can evaluate my labs according to your ideas, and perhaps you would disagree with that, but I'm showing you all what eating an animal-based diet does to blood work. And of course, yes, it will raise LDL, but it will make you very insulin sensitive. For me, it's low HSCRP, high testosterone, and pretty great overall vitality as a 45-year-old. So uh, that's why I'm showing these things. And I think that 
any human who wants to exist in the nutrition space and offer ideas should be willing to show what their health is to kind of corroborate what they're suggesting may be healthy in the hopes that we can just understand better. And yes, there is inter-individual variation, but I don't think it's as great as many people believe it is.